what a time to be alive. What an 18 months we've had. I was at home uh, in Blackburn with me mama for the whole of lockdown. And it was mental. Like so many things we took for granted, we just weren't allowed to do anymore. We weren't allowed to go out to eat. We weren't allowed to shake our friends' hands. This job, my job became illegal. Because this is how we do it. We do it in front of a live audience. We weren't allowed to gather. Therefore, technically, my, lo my job was illegal. And the irony of this job becoming illegal at my big age when I grew up in Blackburn with illegal jobs on my doorstep <laughs> that I thought I was too good for at the time. They were right there. Burglary, drug dealing, fraud. And I was like, no, I'm better than that. <laughs> I'll be honest, I did do a bit of fraud. I did, I did a bit of fraud. Who hasn't done a cheeky bit of fraud in their life? A cheeky bit of fraud. Anyone with blonde highlights in right now is doing a cheeky bit of fraud. A cheeky bit of fraud. I've got contact lenses in. A cheeky bit of fraud. For me, the time I got caught speeding, my mum went to speed awareness course. Who hasn't... Who hasn't sent their mum on a speed awareness course once or twice in their life? And when she comes home, you're like, mother, what did you learn? <laughs> All of that to say, I've missed this job so, so much. And I just want to start with a bit of sincerity. I want to say, from the bottom of my heart, genuinely, having been in Blackburn, in lockdown, with me mama, for the entire time, I want to say genuinely, from the bottom of my heart, I really, really missed white people. Oh my God, I missed you guys. <laughs> I missed you guys so much. I mean, these are I get a whole minute, but you lot, I've missed you. I've missed you so much. Oh, white people out in the wild again. Oh, free range organic white people again. Mm. Mm. We, get, we have white people in Blackburn, but not the premium southern white people. Not the Marks and Spencers white people. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. Mm, mm. I've missed you guys. I read some about you, though. I read some about you. It was in the independent newspaper, um, real paper, real headline, back in March. You can look it up afterwards. It said, and I quote, it said, more white people have been arrested for terrorism in the UK in the past year than any other ethnic group. And I read that, and I thought, O-M-A. We've lost some people on that. She, she has no idea what's going on there. She's like, what's, what is it? A lot of Muslims haven't got it either, which is weird. I was in Liverpool a few weeks ago doing my tour show, and I said OMA, everyone laughed except this one guy. He looked a bit confused, a couple of rows back. <laughs> he turned to his missus and he goes, I don't get it. And she looked at him and she goes, oh, it's all my Asians? <laughs> what? I wasn't thinking, oh my, I'm your Khan. That's not what I was thinking. <laughs> anyway, so I read this headline. It said, more white people have been arrested for terrorism in the UK in the past year than any other ethnic group. And genuinely, I read that and I thought, oh my God, is there no end to these people's cultural appropriation? <laughs> Will they not leave my people with anything? <laughs> Look, we're all good at what we're good at. White people, you've got cheese and hooliganism. My people, we've got match fixing and blowing things up. Leave us alone. You're going to take that off us in a lockdown? <laughs> Very cheeky behaviour. That's why we have to bring the Taliban back. <laughs> Go get them, boys. <laughs> so I was in Blackburn for the whole of lockdown with my mama. And honestly, I cannot recommend being in lockdown with an Asian mom enough. <laughs> Next time you have a lockdown, just get one in it. She's, honestly, <laughs> they are amazing. They're the best of the best. I have had an amazing time. I have barely lifted a finger for 18 months. <laughs> My mom has done everything. Cooking, cleaning, ironing, tidying. Don't get me wrong, when I go in the bathroom and shut the door, that shit is on me. I, <laughs> I handle my shit in there like a big boy. But outside the safe space of the bathroom, my mum does everything for me. And I can see some judgmental looks. I can feel like, mm, 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 mm. You know, why is it a stereotype test? Why am I helping your mama for? 
possible. <laughs> I get it, you're not wrong, but I'll say to that, is I am one person. I am barely one humble guy. She is an entire Asian mum. <laughs> Have we tried stopping them? It's impossible. <laughs> I've been in trouble for this sort of thing before. An ex-girlfriend said to me once, she said, Tez, why are you so undomesticated? Why are you so useless around the house? And explained to her, I said, darling, okay, fair enough. What you gotta understand is, growing up, my mum did everything for me. Everything. And when she didn't do it, she got my sister to do it. Now, all right, all right. I'm not saying it's right, it's not right, but it is what happened though. What I'm saying is, when you're 12 years old, and no one forces you to do chores, what 12 year old volunteers to do chores? Not this guy. But I explained to her, I said, look, listen, I would come home from school every single day, I'm 12 years old, see it on the set, what's a bit of Scooby doing it? <laughs> Mom comes home from work, she's knackered, but she gets on with it, cooking, cleaning, ironing, tidying, whatever needs doing. If it gets too much for her, she gets my sister involved. No one asks me. So I grew up into this useless man-child. <laughs> and it causes problems. When I move away from home and go to university to live in house shares, when I move to London to live in house shares, it causes problems, issues, fights even. When I get a bit older and get into proper relationships, it causes problems, issues, fights, breakups even. So I explained to her, I said, babes, what you gotta understand, the take-off message from this is that I, Tez Ilias, I'm a victim of the patriarchy. <laughs> Very hard life, hard life. It's very sad. I said, babe, come on, you get that, don't you, the feminist? And she's like, yeah. I went, thanks, love, poor kettle on. You know, just, you know, just. <laughs> All right, not a lot of sympathy for that. Um, <laughs> try this. Earlier in the pandy, uh, my mum got ill. Uh, she wasn't feeling well. Um, in lockdown one, the good one. Um, <laughs> now, shut up, how good was lockdown one, though? <laughs> no, lockdown one was good, innit? I loved lockdown one. The problem with lockdown is it went on too long, innit? If lockdown was just when we went into it first in March last year, up till June last year, you know when Dominic Cummings went for his eye test? <laughs> if lockdown was just them three months out of one of them every five years, it went on too long, innit? The problem with lockdown, the became, lockdown became like the Matrix films. First one, poof, amazing. Each one got shitter and shitter and shitter. Lockdown one, mom's not feeling well. And as good as lockdown one was, do you remember how paranoid we were at the beginning of the first lockdown? I thought it was gonna be like 28 days later, like a full on zombie apocalypse. I remember the first time I left the house in the first lockdown, I had my little mask on. If someone was walking on the same side of the street as me, I'd go in the middle of the road or I'd cross over. <laughs> like now we don't care in it. Now, now we, got, we got the jobs now, we don't lick a lamppost now, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but back then we were proper pazied. Um, I, give me a cheer if you're jabbed up. <laughs> now, so now I've got the old one, two, nothing to worry about from me. Um, this is what I'm curious about. Who got ill after getting one or both jabs? Give me a little cheer. <laughs> cool. Quite a few of you, very interesting. I didn't get any symptoms after either of my jabs, but that's because I'm not a pussy. <laughs> Locked on one. Mom's not feeling well. And this is before testing. This is before we know what a PCR or a lateral flow was. And mom's not feeling well. And, and, and you're, just, you're just getting whatever they're telling you off the telly, but you're reading off the internet, you're trying to match that up with the symptoms that someone's got at home. And each subsequent day, mom's feeling worse, which is what they say happens with COVID. You know, you're feeling the worst, hoping for the best. And there's no one I love in this world more than my mom. So I'm really worried about her. And then you know that voice at the back of your head. You know one that talks to you. We've all got one. He starts speaking to me, and my voice is an asshole. <laughs> so he pipes up, right, and he goes, he, it is me. Um, <laughs> this guy, <laughs> he goes, <laughs> he goes, psst, psst, I'm like, what? He goes, listen, you know, you know if mom dies, yeah? You know if mom dies, yeah? How? How are we gonna eat? I'm like, what the hell? 
How can he be so insensitive at a time like this? And as you well know, our sister lives around the corner. <laughs> I have missed this job a lot, so, so much. The number one thing I missed about this job, and it is because I'm a narcissist, <laughs> is the clapping, the big rounds of applause. the clapping so so much because remember this is my job this is what I do for a living minimum twice a show I get a massive round of applause coming on stage leaving stage sometimes in the middle of a show just like that completely organically Three, four, five big rounds of applause every single show, four, five nights a week for 10 years. You are not the same person at the end of that. <laughs> that fundamentally rewires your brain. I'm a clapaholic. I'm a clap junkie. I can't function without claps. I need claps to let me know that I'm a worthy human being. But then all of a sudden, last March, without warning, overnight, boom, government switched my top off. No more claps for Tez Elias. I became one of you lot. Just... <laughs> Piece of shit. You know, just... <laughs> you know, most people doing their day-to-day -day job, they don't get claps, in it. You just do your job, no one's applauding you. When you walk into the office, the elevator opens, no one's going, yeah, you come to work, it doesn't happen. <laughs> I come off there, you're like, yeah, he's here. You know. I... It didn't happen for you lot like that. And it was difficult for me adjusting back to civilian life. So it was tricky. And I thought, you know, where, where do you substitute claps from? Where do you get claps from in real life? And it was tricky for me because I'm a single guy. So I didn't have anyone's cheeks to clap at home. Um, <laughs> unnecessary, that. Um, I didn't say come with your family, did I? You did that on your own. Um, I didn't say come with your mum, so. So it was like two, three weeks into the pandemic. And I'm really getting withdrawal symptoms. I need some claps just to carry me through the next couple of weeks. I'm like, where do I get these claps from? And then I had an amazing idea. In my room, I saw the washing basket. And I picked it up. And I didn't, I didn't know I could do that. <laughs> I thought it was stuck to the... But I pick, you know, like Captain America at the end of Endgame and he picks up Thor's hammer. I was like, huh? <laughs> I'm worthy. I didn't even know, I thought it was, I don't know how my mum used to do it, but like I just, I picked it up and I went, oh my days, what a change. So I took it all the way downstairs and I went to the kitchen and I put it in front of the washing machine. I didn't load it, I'm not a prick. But I put it in front of the, I put it in front of the washing machine and I turned to my mum standing in the kitchen and I went, mama, ta-da, ta-da. Nothing, absolutely nothing from my mum. Not even a sarcastic, slow, you know that, that slow hand clap that means sarcasm. Not even one of them. I'd have even taken that. That's methadone. I would have taken one of them. <laughs> Not even that. I was like, but mum, mum, look, I separated the colours and the whites just like London does. <laughs> Nothing, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely nothing from my mum. You know what you have to do in this country last year to get a round of applause? Save a life. <laughs> is that our country now? Is that, is that a civilized country, that? <laughs> is that you lot now? <laughs> Let me open my cheek. <laughs> Turn it up. <laughs> is, that, is that you now? Yeah. Isn't that a civilized country? Yeah. Oh, look, you save a little life. Get a little clap. Oh, look, she didn't let that man die. Well done. <laughs> oh, look, she put in a drip all by herself. Oh, you're a hero. <laughs> oh, look, that GP's in an over the phone consultation. Well done, mate. Well done. Even though they call about ATM to get an appointment, very inconvenient. Well done. Well done. What was that? Sorry? Pay rise? Piss off. Spend that. Spend that. Spend that. <laughs> get your pots and pans out. Let her know you love them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Clap thieves, that's what I call them. 
You know, it's not all frontline professionals, it's not all heroes that work in the NHS. They got HR department, innit? <laughs> they got pen pushers that work there. Did you differentiate where your claps went? When you were on the doorstep like lemmings, did you, were you like, frontline service staff only? No, you clap for all of them. You're like, oh look, that guy disciplined a Filipino nurse for complaining about racism. Well done, mate, well done. Well done. Hero HR, it's NHS HR, so it's a hero automatically. Mm. Oh look, that car park that charges everyone for seeing their dying loved ones. Well done, NHS car park, well done. 15 pounds for 10 minutes, well done. Hero car park. It's a NHS car park, so it has to be a hero. <laughs> Do we have any in? <laughs> NHS stuff, not car parks. <laughs> Very, put your hands up, my NHS lot. Where are you? You're always in. We well, got one there, one right here as well. Thanks. Shut the fuck up. This is my claps! <laughs> Guys, we're gonna play a little game of top trumps and... <laughs> and whoever had the shittest NHS job, you will be thrown out of the show. <laughs> like roughly by the scruff of the neck, get out you fucking clap thief, get the fuck out. Straight out of the fire exit there, straight out of there, get the fuck out, you clap thief. So no pressure, there's no pressure. Um, just, you know, just enjoy yourselves. Ifla, nice and that, what do you do for the NHS? I research people. Boo! Boo! <laughs> IT training and support. You fucking clapped for that last year. <laughs> I've got a Prince 2 qualification. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> mm, four nurses' salaries he's taking. Fucking bottom, mate. You're at the bottom. <laughs> What's up, bro? <laughs> Quick, you put your hand up ten minutes ago, weren't you? Me! Come on, let's talk now. Yeah, pay back for them clubs you stole off me last year. <laughs> what was your name, reminders? Zane. Zane. Nice to meet you, Zane. Zane, what do you do for the NHS? Management. Management. Fuck off. No, what a prick. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> Trying to run it. Well, you fucked it, innit? <laughs> I earned those clubs. <laughs> Tough, bro. Nice and loud for the people at the back. What do you do for the NHS? Um. Fuck off. <laughs> Halal drug dealer, innit? <laughs> Uh, 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 uh. What was it? Sorry, mental health support worker? Yeah. Fuck off. Have you tried not being sad? Mm. Fuck off. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> Fuck off. Mm, mm. Turn that frown upside down. <laughs> Fuck off. He's a little sticker. There you go. Fuck off. <laughs> oh. Are there any GPs in? Yeah, you're, you're you guys GPs. You guys have the fucking easiest job <laughs> in the NHS. When? This is the first time I've seen a GP in two and a half years. I didn't even know you existed. You're like a unicorn. You're like legends. My eyes just deceive me. A GP in real life? You know what their job is in 2021? Google.com. <laughs> At the home, in their PJs, not even wearing a lab coat anymore. Drink, drink. Yeah, what's up? <laughs> yeah, what are your symptoms in that? Right. Google.com? Oh, it's AIDS. It's AIDS. 
Listen, you lovely NHS lot, obviously it's all love. I've got a question for you, comedy aside. What was your genuine opinion on all that? You know that doorstep clapping thing you did for 10 weeks, like going on a doorstep every Thursday, 8 p.m., genuine opinion, what do you think about it? Huh? BS, bullshit. They didn't even want your claps! <laughs> did you hear them? It was bullshit! They spit in the face of your claps! There was me every Thursday, 8 p.m., starving artist, trying to watch my Netflix. People start clapping outside my house. I've got PTSD. I think it's time to tell a joke. I'm like, knock, knock. Then I get back in your house. I'm like, fuck off. <laughs> I'm not going out there to clap for my own brother. I'll tell you what we didn't get for the first time. Probably recorded history this year. New Year resolutions. This was not, cast your mind back to this January, what the mindset of the country, your town or city, and your house was at the beginning of this year, 2021. This was not the year for a new year resolution, was it? <laughs> Could you imagine if one of your friends came up to you, bro, and was like, actually, I'm just gonna try and better myself. No, you're not, Sean. <laughs> this is not the year for you to get six pack, pack it in. Everyone who lives in this country, every single one of us who lives on this island, we all had the same two New Year resolutions. Every single one of us. Don't die. <laughs> Don't get depressed. And that's it. And you know what, London? One out of two is not bad. So well done. <laughs> you survived. You did the kid. Kept Mandy in a job, innit? I had one friend, one friend, one piece of shit that decided to keep a new resolution. And the only reason I found out is because halfway through January, he texted me. And all his text messages said was, hire me, sponsor me, and then a link to a sponsorship thing. Zero context. I didn't know what was going on. So I replied back to him. I went, hire Harry. I'm going to call him Harry for the story uh, because that's his name. <laughs> I went, hire Harry, what, what's that about? And he goes, oh, sorry, Tez, I didn't explain myself. I'm doing dry January. <laughs> I mean, that hasn't explained anything. <laughs> he goes, oh, Tez, mate, I'm not drinking alcohol for a whole month. <laughs> Give me some money. <laughs> it's like, Gary, I'm so confused. Because as you know, I've never drank. So why don't you just take it out of what you owe me? I don't drink, I never have. Give me a cheer if you're drinking tonight. Yeah. Well, a few of you enjoy each of their own, of course. Personally, I don't drink, I never have. And the reason I don't drink is because I'm not an infidel. And uh, <laughs> that's a swing of a bat, by the way, not a beheading, in case. No, all right. No, because I know people love getting offended in 2021 and you want to send a little tweet out, cancel him. No, I threw a board and I swung through it. Beheading is this way. <laughs> Completely different technique. So I said to Harry, why didn't you take it out of what you or me? And Harry replies back to me going, um, you're being very facetious, Tez, which in his defense, I was. He's like, obviously, you not drinking is not a big deal, is it? Because it's not part of your culture. Whereas drinking in excess is a big part of my culture. So me not drinking for a whole month actually is a big deal, mate. Fair enough, Harry, good point, well made. I still don't understand why I've got to give you money for that, though. <laughs> if you don't want to drink, don't drink. If you think not drinking somehow makes you a better person, crack on. But when I stopped being homophobic, people didn't give me money for that, did they? <laughs> I just stopped doing it. I didn't know I could monetize that. I didn't know I could get sweet, sweet coin out of it. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be at Pride every single year with a bucket collection going, put some change in there. Otherwise, some heckling's about to go down. <laughs> Give it up for nothing, like an idiot. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like I've become really grumpy. <laughs> I, was, I was at the doctor's a few weeks ago, getting some bloods done. And there was a nurse doing the, doing, doing the procedure. And you get chatting, as you do. Towards the end of the procedure, apropos of nothing, out of nowhere, no one brought this up. She turns to me and she goes, you know you don't look your age. And I went, oh, thank you. <laughs> and then she goes, no. I mean, 
you don't look your age. You look older than your age. What? No one asked you in it. Why are you telling me that? No one brought that up. We clapped for you last year, you bitch. Take them back. I didn't ask her. Why is she saying that for? Uninvited compliments. Num, 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 num. Give me them all day long. Uninvited insults about as welcome as Pretty Patel's own parents under her new immigration rules. I don't want them. I don't want it. I don't want it. <laughs> I am getting older. Of course I'm getting older. Even the baby's getting older by the second. That's just how time works, isn't it? I'm not just linked to my grumpiness, though. I, I mean, I am grumpy. I'm not grumpy. Everything makes me grumpy now. Dumb questions make me grumpy. Some people have patience with it. I do not have patience for dumb questions. You know who asks the world's dumbest questions? Andy's. <laughs> me and mum's friends. They ask the world's dumbest questions. They've come to see my mum. Don't bother me. <laughs> They'll come up to me and be like, what the son? When are you getting married? When you leave your husband, that's when. <laughs> leave your husband, innit? Let's do it. Why are you dancing around this auntie? Let's get it on. <laughs> Let me be a stepdad to my friend. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do this. They don't ask again. <laughs> I'll tell you what else makes me grumpy. When I'm driving, and other people are driving, that pisses me off. Why, why are you here? Well, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to go somewhere. Why are you driving here? Vexes me. Lord's Biscoff. I... Hate Lotus Biscoff. Why? Why? Why have you motherfuckers put it in everything? You can't turn without seeing Lotus Biscoff in something. You know that biscuit you ignored in three star hotels for 25 years? Why is it in everything now? A shit overrated Tory malted milk. Biscoff, I don't want it. And you might be like, no, chance, you know, those are trivial things, really. You know, they're not really, they're not really the important things in life. They're getting grumpy about. You know, come on, you can let stuff like that go. Yeah, but I know I've become like this. It's not an accident. I um, oh, during the pandemic, I lost someone, right? And when and when that happens last year, last year, and when that happens, it does change you. You come out of that. Anyone who's been through something similar, you know what I'm talking about. You come out of it differently. And for me, I lost someone super close. Like the closest thing you can imagine. You know, where she was there every single day of my life, and the whole life, poor. And I was there, you know. And when that happens, it does, it does change you. You, you. you see the world differently. You process things differently. You react to things differently, innit? And for me, when I lost my... Um, when I when I lost my when I lost my uh, metabolism, it was uh, it was really um, <laughs> fuck are you laughing at you skinny prick? So good being back doing this job, and I love this venue so so much. But I, you know, it just triggered me slightly, and I have to apologise to everyone at my three o'clock, at my nine o'clock, and probably my two o'clock, at my ten o'clock as well, because you guys are getting this view in it. All they've seen this entire show is this. <laughs> and this this wasn't there last year. Pre-pandy, this this is this is new. This this right here is an eat out to help our baby. <laughs> Otherwise known as the best month of my life. 
oh my God, I love to eat out to help out so much. Listen, I'm sorry about anyone's grandma, in it, but the whole pandemic was worth it for eat out to help out. <laughs> I had such a come down after eat out to help out. When eat out to help out finished, all I was left with was this. It was the biggest come down since India's expectations at Cricket World Cup. It was awful. <laughs> I'll tell you what I did realize about myself in the pandemic, because we a lot of downtime, a lot of thinking time. And what I found out about myself is that I, Tez Ilyas, will never ever agree with politically, morally, philosophically, anything, the Tory party, the conservatives. It's just not who I am. I'm not built that way. It's not who I am. But, yeah, feel silly clapping now, don't you, Mandy? <laughs> Premature slapulation. Um, but I get it. I understand why people vote conservatives. And the reason why people vote conservatives is, sorry, let me clarify. I understand why older people vote conservatives. I don't know why young people vote conservatives. Cunts. But I understand why. <laughs> But I understand why all the people vote conservatives. And all the people vote conservatives, not because they like conservatives, not because they agree with conservatives. They feel about the conservatives the same way we feel about conservatives. But the reason they vote for them is to troll young people's futures. And that is something I can get behind, because fuck young people. <laughs> metaphorically, metaphorically, not. <laughs> metaphorically. Not literally, obviously, I'm not, I'm not from Rotherham. Met metaphorically, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not from there. And you might be like, oh, Tess, why are you being so harsh? Listen, I'm not just saying it like to be contrarian. I'm not just trying to play to the grumpy uncle persona. For me, it's a legit thing. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a real thing, personal thing for me. As many of you know, I am in a show called Man Like Moby. And I love, loved being in that show so, so much. I love playing a role of my life. I love it to bits. And I love how much joy it brings me. I love how much joy it brings you. And it's brought me so many fans. And I love it, love it, love it. However, it is my gift and my curse. Because eight, the character, is a dumb. He's dumb in it. Like, he's d there's no, you can't put your foot around it. He's dumb. Like, he probably drinks water from a pond. Like, he's dumb. <laughs> Like it's dominant. And because of that, what it's meant for me, Tez Ilyas in real life, is that that character, Eight, yeah. has attracted like-minded people <laughs> to my social media. <laughs> and so now my social media is a collection of the dumbest motherfuckers <laughs> on this planet. Present company excluded. <laughs> Obviously. Just, you know how many I hate dumb questions? Always with the dumb questions. I'll put a post, I've got this show. DMs, when is it? Fucking on the post, ain't it? It's on the fucking post. <laughs> well, what time is it? It's fucking on the post! <laughs> where, where is it? But fucking, fucking read it! <laughs> and a lot of the dumb people that follow me are kids. And when I say kids, I don't even mean like, 19, 20-year-olds. I don't mean uni students. I mean children. Because children love that show. They probably shouldn't, bad parenting, but they love that show. And they're on social media. We're on social media. They find us afterwards. They start following us. And that's fine. And after a while, they slide into my DMs. They send me a private message. I don't want to talk to them. <laughs> what am I going to say to a child? So I ignore their message. I delete their message request. And then what they do is, they go on a public profile, underneath one of my public posts, and in front of everyone, they be like, Oi, hey! At Tez Ilias, why did you ignore my message? Why haven't you replied to me? Because I'm your fucking dad, Jage, that's why! <laughs> Talk to your dad, innit? Make a friend at school, why are you bothering me for? <laughs> I swear to God, these kids do not care about my welfare. They will happily send me to prison as long as I reply to them. 
for me, this grumpiness starts at home. It starts at home. I've got this niece. She turned 18 over the summer. And two months ago, September, she's left home to live away at university. She's, she's moved away. And I'm really glad she's moved away uh, because she is an asshole. <laughs> and before you judge me on that and take sides, let me tell you what my niece has done. Then you can make a decision. My niece, without telling anyone, without talking to a single member of our family, without seeking permission from a single living soul, my niece is five foot 10. <laughs> Why has she done that? I feel like some of you are not listening to what I'm saying. I'm five foot eight and my niece is five foot. What the fuck are you doing up there? I don't understand why she's done this to us. We used to get on really, really well, me and her. I can't go out with her anymore. I'm like a pet. <laughs> I swear to God, at one point over the summer, we're celebrating her A-level results. We've gone to Alton Towers, you know, the Northern Thorpe Park. I'm the king of oblivion. We're going round and round, queuing up on these stairs. I swear to God, at one point, she looks at me like, Uncle, are you even tall enough to go on the... Fuck off! <laughs> why has she done this to us? Is it a Gen Z protest? Is it a TikTok challenge? Is that a climate change thing? Are you gonna fix the ozone layer yourself up there? What are you doing? I don't know why she's done this to us. She's gone to Leeds to do linguistics. It's like, why do you need all of that then? Because she's skinny as well, my niece. She could probably be a model. She's got the facilities for it. And I support that. I'm like, oh, that can't work, babes. Go make your money. But no, you're doing a language degree. What are you gonna do? Graduate and then talk down to people? Parents in the room, give me a cheer. Yeah. Parents. What's, what's, what's your name, my love? Anna. Anna. Yeah? Like a palindrome? Yeah. You don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> keep, that, keep that in the edit. Um, nice to meet you, Anna. Anna, do you have kids? Lovely. Uh, how many kids do you have, Anna? Two. two. I think two's a nice number. Do you like them? Thank you, depends which day you ask me. Thank you for your honesty, Anna. Because I didn't ask Anna if she loves them. Of course, Anna loves her kids. Does Anna like her kids? Every parent knows that isn't the same question. Because I don't have kids, Anna, you know, because I value my spare time. And um, my sister, my older sister has five kids. Five. And I do not like those kids. Like, I love them. I love my sister's kids. I would die for two of those kids. But you know, I don't, I don't like any of them. Um, I mean, Big Bird's a problem, isn't it? She's, she's annoying. Um, I fell out with her younger brother. Um, he's eight. Um, well, why, are you, why are you laughing? No, 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 what, what? Have I broken a law? Have I broken a rule? What, what, what law? No, what, no, what law says I can't fall out with an eight-year-old? I don't discriminate, yeah? For me, a prick's a prick, innit? I'm not gonna be like, I'm not gonna start giving him a student discount because he's eight years old. What do I look like? ASOS.com. I'll tell you what's happened. I've taken the family, the five kids and their mum, to Disneyland. Because I'm a good egg. Um, Paris, no. <laughs> not, not Florida, no. Not Champions League Disney. Um, Europa Disney, Paris. I've taken them. I've taken them to Europa Disney. And I love Disney. I love Disney so very, very much. It's one of my favorite things in the whole wide world. But I can't enjoy myself. I've paid for this trip. My entire enjoyment depends on them enjoying themselves. So if they don't have a good time, I might as well wipe my ass with that money. <laughs> my nephew, that I'm talking about now, he's eight. Imagine that, eight years old. The first time he's got to go to Disneyland. Anna, you know how old I was? You know, the first time I went to Disneyland, you know how old I was? The day I took him to Disneyland! <laughs> I can't enjoy myself! <laughs> we fell out, me and this kid. Before I tell you why and how we fell out, for balance, let me say this. My niece smashed it on this trip. She was incredible. Not Big Bird, her younger... <laughs> she's got a younger sister. And my younger niece was incredible. Now, what you need to know about my younger niece is that she has a, she's disabled. She has a physical disability. And because of that, 
but you all got a wristband, that means we can skip the queue for every ride. <laughs> what a legend. <laughs> she saved us two years of our lives. <laughs> Honestly, play of the tournament. <laughs> MVP, she was, oh, mm. But I fell out with her brother, and this is what happened. It's the end of the trip. We've done that thing that everyone here has done at some point in their life. We bought presents for people who aren't with us. So for example, my younger sister, who's not on the trip with us, I bought her slippers that look like, um, you know, Sully, the big monster in Monsters, Inc. I bought her slippers that look like his feet. It's very cute. Now the problem is, I've got no space left in my suitcase. I've maxed out my luggage, as has every other person on this trip. Because Asians, we are very, very bad packers. <laughs> packers, I said. <laughs> the only person who's got any space left is this little eight-year-old. He's got a little bit of space left in his rucksack, his carry-on. I open up the zip, shove the slippers in there, close it, he's none the wiser. Now we're on the coach transfer back to the airport. He, was, he opens up his bag. I don't know why, to get some sweets out, I'm not sure. You see the slippers, he's not happy takes them out, shoves them in my lap. I don't want them. I'm like, well, that's worked out wonderfully because they're not for you. I'm like, put them back in the bag. No. What do you mean, no, why not? Because at the airport, they'll ask me if I pack my own bag. <laughs> You're eight years old, innit? They're not gonna ask you if you packed your own bag, put them back in. No. Put them back in the bag? No. Please. <laughs> you, need to, you need to understand what's going on. Like, if you don't take the slippers, they can't go. Then your auntie, my younger sister, won't get a present, and then she'll be upset with me. And he goes, yeah. Sounds like a you problem. <laughs> At that moment, I've lost my temper. Even my inner asshole comes out, he's like, Punch him. <laughs> Do Randy, yeah? Just, just. I lost my temper. I'm like, listen, yeah? You need to understand what's going on. Your uncle, who has paid for this trip, wants you to put the slippers in that bag. So put the goddamn slippers in that goddamn bag. Now, to cut a slightly longer story short, I wore the slippers home. Because you can't, you can't negotiate with terrorists, you can't, you can't... It was my fault for trying, really, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have tried it. Um, I'm an idiot. Do you hit the manor? No. I, I thought I'd try and catch you out. I thought, I, thought, I thought what I'll do is, I thought I'll ask you a question, tell you a couple of stories, boom! Cameras are watching. No, you're too cooked for me, Anna. Fair enough. You should hit your kids. Um, not, not you specifically, I'm saying, if you've got kids, hit your kids. And look, I understand the argument that you shouldn't hit kids. I have read a blog, uh, but I don't agree with it. And the reason is this. Now, what I'm gonna say next, London, I'm gonna say on quite general terms. <laughs> so don't, don't jump down my throat. Now. <laughs> White people I love you, but you lot don't hit your kids in it. <laughs> or at least you don't hit them enough. <laughs> and then your kids put you in care homes. <laughs> Whereas brown parents, black parents, kick the shit out of us, and then we keep them at home till they die. Till they die. Like some sort of weird Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> so anyone with young kids, Anna, this is my genuine advice. A slap a day will keep the care home away. <laughs> I'll tell you what else makes me grumpy. Social media. Social media is a plague. I'm a hypocrite, because I'm on it. I need it for my job. But why has it made us all so dumb? I'm on Twitter, 
because I like to watch the world burn in real time. And, and on Twitter, I follow Gary Neville. I'm not a United fan, but I like Gary. <laughs> Fucking Neville Neville's in. It's a very niche joke, that. Very niche, very niche. On Twitter, I follow Gary Neville. I'm not a United fan, but I like Gary Neville. He's got good politics. During the Euros, football Euros this summer, <laughs> Gary Neville, very innocently, tweets out, I think Jordan Pickford's been amazing, the England goalkeeper. I think Jordan Pickford's been amazing. He's been one of England's players of the tournament. Fair enough, pretty, pretty good tweet that. Jordan Pickford kept six clean sheets. It's pretty solid. Someone called Tom, with his 17 followers, <laughs> replies to a whole Gary Neville, in public, with this absolute gem, which I'm going to perform for you now. Yeah! Jordan Pickford's been all right, but it's easy to look good when Osama bin Southgate... <laughs> who? <laughs> when Osama bin Southgate parks the bus. <laughs> now, if you're not familiar with football parlance, parks the bus means when you play defensive, boring football. Who's Osama bin Southgate, though? <laughs> now, I don't know how well read the people of London and the surrounding areas are. Personally, I only know one. One Osama bin. That's it. You know who I'm talking about. You know who I mean. When I say the one Osama bin, you know who I mean. The OG, the Godfather. You know who I'm talking about. <laughs> Come on. You know who I mean. Uncle Bin, you know who I mean. Throwback Thursday, the legend, you know who I'm talking about. We all miss him. Lambuji, you know who I mean. Come on. Amir Saab, you know who I'm talking about. So it's probably safe to assume that this man, Tom, is comparing England manager Gareth Southgate to former Al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden. Now, I am all for ludicrous comparisons. They make me laugh, but they have to make sense. There has to be some sort of logic there. Because if, you, because if your problem with Gareth Southgate is that England play boring defensive football, sure, I disagree with that, but we can have a discussion about that, innit? Osama bin Laden was unknown for his defense! <laughs> if anything, he was too attack-minded. He was the Arsene Wenger of terrorism. <laughs> Earlier this year, uh, the Queen's husband passed away, Prince Philip passed on, and obviously very sad for the royal family. Someone on Twitter, on the day of his death, tweets out, in front of the whole world, yes, yeah, so he said that, may he racism in peace. I, I tweeted that. I... <laughs> no, I thought... I thought I was being nice. In peace, I said. The internet was not happy. The mistake I made was screenshotting it and putting it on Facebook. <laughs> Facebook was not happy. I lost 2,000 followers in an hour, in an hour after deleting. You know, we all lost something that day, I guess. I follow this lady on Twitter. I don't know her IRL, but you know, you follow people you don't know. And she, she gets an argument with a guy on Twitter, which is the best part of Twitter, by the way. Just join it for the arguments. It's like watching a tennis match. <laughs> Eventually, he says something to her that pisses her off so much that she replies back with this absolute gem. <laughs> she goes, you can't really have a say on that because you are a, I'm gonna try to remember everything that she said, you are an able-bodied, cisgendered, heteronormative, neurotypical, straight white man. <laughs> Fucking hell. It's a lot, though, ain't it? Split him into bloody seven horcruxes. <laughs> I didn't even know what half they meant. I had to go on thesaurus.com. I was very confused. I, I don't know if it's a good idea to bastardize academic terms and then label each other with them and try and police 
Who can say what, when, and where? I don't know if that's a good idea. I think, I think it's counterproductive. I'll be honest, I don't even know how I feel about scrolling through people's histories and seeing what they've said previously and trying to ruin their lives about it. Like, don't get me wrong. Obviously, words are important. And I, I get that words can hurt. Look at your resolutions. But I understand that. And I promise you, I'm not just being flippant. I am. I promise you, I am anti-racism, anti-sexism, anti-homophobia. I'm against all of that publicly. I'm against all of that. <laughs> when people are paying attention, oh, like everyone else, oh, I will get on my high horse and I will gallop to the moral high ground and I will take a selfie of me being a good guy. Oh, like everyone else, I will do that. But I think there should be a balance. I think in exceptional circumstances, one should be allowed to say a bad word, borderline bigoted, without it necessarily ruining one's life. In exceptional circumstances only. E dot, G dot, example. Let's say I'm doing Lent. Um, obviously, I don't do Lent, in it. I do Ramadan, not diet Ramadan. But let's say, <laughs> but let's say, I can't believe it's not Ramadan. You know, I, d I don't do that. I, but, <laughs> but let's, <laughs> I've never said that before. <laughs> but let's say I was let's say I was doing Ramadan light and and I and let's say let's say I smash it. 40 days, 40 nights giving up my vice, which is obviously sugar. And I smash it. I don't cheat even one time. Now it's the first day I'm allowed to eat sugar again, aka Easter. And I've got a gig in London, let's say. And I get off a King's Cross station. And I go across the concourse on the way to the underground. And on the way to the underground, I get distracted by my crack den. Lawless cupcake stand. <laughs> and I am jonesing for it. I have earned this cupcake. There's never been a cupcake I've earned more in my life than this one. So I get in the queue at Lawless cupcake stand. Queuing in front of me happens to be a larger person. No judgment, that's just what's happening in the story. They get served, they leave. Now it's my turn. And I'm like, hi, am I? Hi, yeah, hi. Can I get a peanut butter jelly cupcake, please? It's my favorite one. And the person serving me says, I'm really sorry, sir. The person before you took the last one. I'm just saying, am I the worst person in the whole wide world if for a split second, my inner asshole comes out and is like, oh, what a fat cunt. Does that make me the worst person in the world? I haven't screamed it out loud, I haven't chased them down the platform, I haven't pushed them on the tracks. I thought a bad word for a split second. I'm like, fine, what else do you have? And he says, Lotus Biscoff. And I'm like, go fuck yourself. <laughs> Biscoff. Let's say I start seeing a lady. And it's a, it's a new thing. And let's say on the day of this hypothetical story, I am spending the evening at hers. And let's say we are... As the kids would say, mid-coitus. <laughs> and let's say mid-coitus, her partner walks in. <laughs> oh, shit. And then I realize, I see there's a baseball bat right by the door frame where this person is stood. And I think that's it. He's going to lob her heads off last day of my life. But instead of reaching for the baseball bat, this person verbally loses their shit. And he's like, ah! Oh, my God! Helen! It's Helen. Helen. <laughs> Helen. Oh, Helen! I can't believe you do this to us! You filthy patty shagger! I'm just saying that I would be here in the corner, like... <laughs> well, he's not talking to me. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> I think that's what the rule should be. I think the rule should be, if you cause someone enough harm, or they cause you enough harm, that it warrants 
justifies a punch in the face, you should be allowed to swap that punch in the face for a bad word. I've even got a slogan for it. Don't give me a black eye, call me a pack eye. No, all right, all right, no, all right. All right, no, the slogan is workshopping, uh, but it's... The, the slogan is workshopping, all right, fine. I think it's a good idea, though. We could, we could reduce physical violence. That's a problem in society. We could create a whole new cussing culture. Remember your, mo remember your mama jokes? Oh my days, what a time to be alive that was. I miss them days, innit? This could be a, mo this could be a generation's your mama battles, innit? Oh, I missed that so much. I, I took this idea to my friend Dennis. Uh, Dennis is one of the smartest people that I know. I met him at university, so I've known him almost 20 years. And he's the guy I take all my good ideas to. He's a, he's a black guy who lives in South London. And so I finished the PowerPoint presentation. And I was like, ta-da, Dennis, black guy, black guy. What do you think? And Dennis goes, no, no, yeah, we're not going to be doing that. I'm like, oh, Dennis, why not? It's a really good idea. And he goes, listen, Tez, I don't care what I've done to someone. They can try and punch me in the face all they want. But I will never, ever let someone who's not black call me the N-word. Which is obviously, I'm not going to say the N-word. That's not my word to use. Of course, I'm not an American police officer. So <laughs> I was like, oh, all right, Dennis, I get that. But it's a, it's a good idea, though. And then Dennis goes, actually, Tez, your plan is massively flawed. I'm like, what do you mean flawed? Flawed how? More like flawed Mayweather. What are you talking about? Where's it, <laughs> where's it flawed from? He goes, okay, bear with me. Us lot, BAME, people of color, ethnic minorities, whatever they want to call us these days, there's plenty of words to use against us, yeah? I went, yeah. Because women of any shade, there's plenty of words to use against them. I went, yeah. Because disabled people of any shade, there's plenty of words to use about them. I went, yeah. Because gay people of any shade, there's plenty of words to use about them. I went, yeah, what's your point? Because my point is, is what you call an able-bodied straight white man who's not ginger or fat. To be honest, I've only put this tour on to try and get a suggestion. <laughs> There's nothing. Nothing exists. I've, this is show number 42 of the tour. People have been shouting out suggestions. Nothing exists. I'll be honest, yesterday, someone in Nottingham shouted out Gammon. And, <laughs> and Gammon, Gammon, I think Gammon is offensive. I think Gammon is a pejorative word. But it doesn't have the same history as the N word or the P word or the F word, or the S word. Inshallah, it will one day. But right now, <laughs> right, I mean, we've got to work together to make that happen. But right now, it doesn't, it's not on the same level as those ones, innit? I was in, I was in Birmingham last week, and this guy from Alam Rock goes, Gora Pakora, and I was like, all right, that's all right. All right. For the non Punjabi speakers, Gora Pakora means white person, onion bhaji. I mean, <laughs> you can live with that. that is, that's not going to ruin your evening. It's only funny because it rhymes in Punjabi. It's not the same as the N word or the P word. So, you know, I apologize. I know a lot of you are looking forward to going out there and use and, you know, being going like, going, I don't know, like going to tie ups and being like, mm, this is smelly, whatever, you know, but you can't. I'm sorry, you're going to have to all stand down. We can't, we can't use those words, any of us, um, because it's not, it's not an equal playing field out there. Because once again, able-bodied straight white men have ruined everything! <laughs> By being so bulletproof, well done, lads. <laughs> We're coming for you. <laughs> it's not just social media that makes me grumpy, though. If anything, the actual media makes me even grumpier. The BBC, our pride and joy, early this year, they ran an investigation. It was on TV, a little report, and then they wrote a whole lengthy article on BBC Sport, because it was a sporting matter. And they tried to answer a question, which they did a whole investigation on. Bear in mind, this is the BBC who we pay our license fee to. So they spent taxpayers' money on answering this question. And the question was, why aren't there more BAME, as in black and minority ethnic people, why aren't there more BAME <laughs> Skiers and snowboarders. <laughs> what? Who the fuck is that keeping up at night? <laughs> Who cares about that? Who wrote to Jimmy Savile to fix that? <laughs> we do not care about that. 
that has never ever come up in my friendship circle. It's never been mentioned on the international BAME WhatsApp group. It's never been brought up at home. My mum's never gone, why have you never bought me skis for Mother's Day? She's never mentioned it. And we live on a really steep hill in Blackburn. But she's never thought one day I'll ski down that. She's not even asked for a sled. We don't want to go. No one's stopping us. It's cold. And it's really expensive. There you go, I save you 30 minutes on a panorama documentary. Roll credits. We don't want to go there. Black runs don't matter. Very knee skiing joke. We don't want to go. <laughs> Being people. We was cool runnings like it was the Revenant. It's terrifying. <laughs> Sanka, you're dead. I will be for go there. That's why I'm at home. <laughs> Being people, we got bigger things in life to worry about than skiing and snowboarding. Like the acronym BAM. <laughs> oh, I hate BAM so much. Much. Well, I hate BAME more than I hate racism. There, I said it. I hate BAME so, so much. BAME. 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 Lame. The same. Blame. Oh, I hate BAME so much. You know who smashed it? You know who smashed the abbreviation game? The LGBT lot. They have smashed it. You know what their full abbreviation is in 2021? You know what the full thing is now? L-G-B-T-Q-I-A-P-K. That's an abbreviation, not BIM. <laughs> you know what the A stands for in BIM? And. <laughs> We've got BIM and they've got all of that. The last four letters of LGBTQIAPK is IAPK. That's an anagram of Paki. How have they got that one? How have they got that one? And we're stuck with BIM. Oh, there's a cherry on top of LGBTQIAPK. Plus, there's a plus at the end of it. They're doing algebra. My people invented algebra. How have they got that one? They've got all of that, and they've got BIM. <laughs> What's the other one they're forcing on us? What's the other one they're forcing on us? Person of color. Puck. Puck off, I don't want it. <laughs> How is colored people racist? But magically, people of color is not racist. <laughs> I know you might be sat there thinking, very funny, Tess, very passionate. But what's the right term then? What do we call it then? Settle down, my children. I'm not going to give you problems without solutions. I solved it. The right one has been there the whole time. It's currently being misused by someone else. But we're going to take it off them and make it our own. We're going to appropriate it off someone else. And the right one for us, this is what we're going to do from now on. B, B, C. That's ours. That's ours from now on. B, B, C. What do they stand for? Good question. Blacks, browns, Chinese. Zulu-looking people. That is all of us. Blacks, browns, Chinese, Zulu-looking people. That is every single one of us. Who does that leave out? No one. And now we're not going to ask you dumb questions like the old BBC did. And I'm like, why are there so few BIM skis and snowboarders? We're not going to be like, oh, why are there so few white people playing kabaddi? I don't know because Anna doesn't want to get a slap and there's nothing wrong with that. It's a very physical sport. <laughs> oh, why are there so few ISIS members at Winter Wonderland? Because it's not for them. <laughs> what are they going to do there? It's German Marcus and mulled wine. They're not going to have a nice time. <laughs> oh, oh, why are there so few Bengali basketball players? Because fucking how? <laughs> how are they going to do it? Five for one LeBron James over here. <laughs> the Clive has got 90 runs in cricket. They're gonna play basketball. <laughs> Not everything is for everyone, and there's nothing wrong with that. We will keep the license fee though. <laughs> Call it reparations. 
why are there so few big skis and snowboarders? It's so dumb. I am. Um, I am. Um, I went skiing last year. <laughs> oh, don't judge me, eh? I know you're like, oh, says we thought you're a working class brown hero. I am. I didn't go skiing, I got to do skiing. There's a subtle difference. I got invited to do some gigs in the French Alps last January before the pandemic, and as part of it, I got to go skiing. I didn't go to do it, I got to do it. Do not be fooled by the chalets that I've got. I'm still, I'm still Tazzy from the block. Here's my final joke. This is a rhetorical question. Uh, you know what that is, isn't it? You passed. Um, okay. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Final question. What would you call? That's what would you call an Asian archaeologist? Indian Jones? No, fuck off, London. Fuck off. I didn't say it was a good joke, did I? I didn't say he is the best joke of the show. I said he is a joke. He's been in lockdown for 18 months, you ungrateful pigs. <laughs> all right, quick history lesson, and then we will all go. In the year 1 BC, uh, that's one before Corona, um, <laughs> so 2019, I was in Walsall in the West Midlands near Birmingham, and I got to the end of my set, and I like doing that Indian Jones joke because it makes me laugh, if no one else. <laughs> I went to tell it, and this is what happened. And guys, what would you call? That's, what would you call? An Asian archaeologist, <laughs> I'll never forget it in my life. This voice from the back of the room just shouts out, dig deep. That's funnier than what I was going to say. <laughs> Put that deep in my pocket for a rainy day. Thank you very much. That was hilarious. That is genuinely the best heckle I have ever received in my life. It was witty, funny, on point. The timing, eight out of eight. Doesn't always go like that. Sometimes the end of a show can be even worse. One of the last shows I did, practice shows, before the tour actually started, in, this was three months ago in September, I was, I, was playing, um, I was playing a club in North London, liberal Islington, and, <laughs> and I, finished, I, finished the, I finished the show, and I did a little meet and greet, because you, you guys make an effort to come out, I want to say hi to the people that want to say hi to me. So doing a little meet and greet outside in the lobby area, and everyone was queuing up, taking pictures, it was very, very nice. One guy was hanging slightly back, I noticed him. When everyone left, he came forward took a picture, and then he, he told me how much he loved the Indian Jones dig deep stuff, like it really tickled him. I was like, oh, fair enough, you like what you like. And then I thought that was the end of the matter, innit? And I was like, the fall, innit? Go, <laughs> go home, innit? I didn't say it, I was verbally like, no. This guy goes, I've got one for you. <laughs> now I know in my bones that no good is gonna come from this. <laughs> but in that moment, I'm trapped in a conversation. I can't just leave, innit? So I'm like, okay, why is it? This is the joke the man told me. This is exactly how he told it. I go, what is it? First of all, what is that? Why are you looking left and right? If you gotta check the green cross code before you tell a joke, probably don't tell that joke. I got confused, I started doing it with him. He goes, he goes what would you call an Asian? I know what I am. So what would you call an Asian martial artist? Now the question confused me, because Jet Li, I know them man, they Asian as well, innit? You know, your kind of Asian, and the actual, and the actual martial artists, but obviously he, did, he, didn't, he didn't mean them, innit? He didn't mean those lot, because he said he did that. So he obviously meant 
you know, South Asian, Desis, you know, brown, he meant brown town. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, I mean, these jokes, sometimes you can figure them out, you know. But I just didn't show, you know, my brain was mush, and I was like, mm, I don't know, I don't know. What would you call an Asian martial artist? And this man said, Paki Chan. And then he goes, obviously I can't say that, you can say it. You just fucking said it. <laughs> what do you mean you can't say it? How have I heard you if you can't say it? You're not Professor X. <laughs> I'm like, all right, my turn. You're just a guy. I'm a 10 year stand-up comedian. I'm very witty, I pride myself on my quick wittedness. I'm like, all right, my turn. Nothing, <laughs> nothing would come to me. Nothing funny, witty, clever. So I punched him in the face. <laughs> and I, that's what you get for taking terrorism off as you go up a corner. <laughs> and then I panicked and I was like, oh my God, did I do good? You did wicked. <laughs> Guys, I've been Tess Elias. Good night, Allah bless you all. Thank you so, so much. Thank you!